Moonshot Project is a, a very ambitious idea that California could be fossil free in 10 years. And the mechanism for that happening is basically built on fuel cell technology and what are called microgrids, which in theory could create enough electricity to drive at least most of the processes in the state. Uh, certainly it would make California a model for the world because certainly until the world shifts its fundamental energy systems and the fundamental paradigm we have away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and to uh, some form of hydrogen energy, uh, we're pretty much going to be struggling to keep uh, our commitment to growth and expansion alive at the same time we're trying to preserve the planet and create a sustainable environment for everybody. Why is it called the Moonshot Project? Well, it's the Moonshot Project primarily because, at least in our lifetime, uh, human beings going to the moon was probably the, the grandest and most unpredictable and perhaps even the greatest human accomplishment from at least a technological point of view uh, that we've ever encountered. Perhaps the Human Genome Project today is now equal to that. But certainly at the time, the Moonshot, the, the uh, Kennedy's declaration of sending a man to the moon and bringing him back uh, in less than 10 years was was a very much of an out-of-the-box uh, uh, declaration of possibility. Uh, that vision basically drove an enormous amount of research, science, technology, coordination, uh, and that investment uh, has paid off, you know, a hundred times over in terms of other areas of life that have nothing directly to do with the moon. Uh, but nonetheless, the uh, need to change our energy systems or to transform the energy system of California is at least that ambitious. Uh, it will take uh, the kind of creativity and human commitment and vision uh, of every, uh, maybe everyone, but certainly the leaders in the state uh, to be able to shift the reliance on fossil fuel uh, to as low as possible, perhaps eliminate. So that's why we call it the Moonshot Project. Um, the, the, the founding uh, zeitgeist of the organization was about consciousness. And um, it emerged because my dear friend Willis Harmon and I had this conversation about how could you shift consciousness, and particularly the business community, which is where we feel that the need is the greatest. In doing that, <clears throat> The, and that hasn't changed in, 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 the, in the years we've been working. What the energy emphasis is about looking at a way to apply a massive consciousness shift. So there's no system on the planet Earth which is more ubiquitous and more powerful than our energy system. So if you think of the, the energy system of planet Earth, what it, how many trillions of dollars that that involves, how it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's in the pharmaceuticals, it's in the gas tanks, it's in home heating, it's in shipping and pipelines and refineries, and we've built a society around this whole energy construct which is as outdated to us as a civilization as chasing whales for, for, for lighting fuel. I mean, it just, it's crazy. And so the academy, which started out completely agnostic about 19 years ago, looking at just what is peak oil. And from that agnostic position, we began to refine our questions, and our questions kept getting deeper and deeper. And we eventually became completely clear that the planet was going to switch energy systems for its own survival. It has to. One way or the other, it will. And either we'll do it traumatically, because climate change disrupts global civilization in such a massive way that it's forced to change. Or we'll do it because we're thoughtful people, and we've evolved enough to not need a crisis to be able to make the shift. Yeah, I, I remember that you and I were talking the other day about how the only thing that we can think of that may be comparable to this was uh, when we sent a man to the moon, that that was an accomplishment right. where we've never been there before, it never got done before. Most people thought it was impossible, right. and yet we did it. And yeah. that, that's the scale of undertaking that you're talking about here in California. Yeah, and beyond, California and beyond. Cal the, the Moonshot Project, which you're alluding to, and we call it that because when Kennedy said, uh, we're going to take a man to the moon and return him safely within 10 years or less in 1961. Uh, he didn't know how to do that. No one did. No one knew what rocket to use. No one knew what configuration was it going to be to, a lunar lander, non-lander. Nobody had any answers at all. But what he had was three objectives. One, he wanted to increase the technical education of people in the United States. Number two, he needed to do something to lift the economy because by 1961 it was clear the post-World War II 
economic boom was starting to come to an end and he, what was the next thing going to be? And he felt the technological impetus could help. Number three, it would play into the, uh, the Cold War and the Russians got Sputnik so we're going to have to one-up them. Uh, but not knowing how they would possibly get the man to the moon and back, they did it. And in our lifetime, we believe the moonshot that we're doing, the California moonshot we call it, is to take and within 10 years transfer all of California off of all forms of fossil and nuclear fuels, period, 100%. And it's doable. So technically, if you say it's doable, it's doable technically. It's doable economically. Um, the only thing that seems to be lacking is people's willingness to do it. And what, what Kennedy did is he gave them the motive, he gave them the impetus. He said, we're going to do this thing, and people bought in, and because they bought in, they achieved something that was so miraculous, nobody even envisioned it as possible. That's how we view the moonshot today. And so if we can, we, we have a, a challenge, not in the technology, which we've been happy to explain what that is, not in the financial, because it works out, it makes money to do this. It's about the, the consciousness of people being able to go to that place. And how we got that name, um, in part, was Deepak Chopra basically said to me, you know, Ronaldo, if you could shift the consciousness about energy, you could shift the consciousness about everything. I said, Deepak, that's really right. And he, and he challenged me to come up with a name that we do, and that was the moon job. You know, but if, if, if it's willingness that's missing, and really how do we get enough people committed to the possibility, then that's really an interesting exercise because that dovetails with the work that we've been doing in transformation for the last 40 years. That's right. And also with the whole point of engaging people to realize that whether they achieve a possible future or whether they simply go along for the ride in a predictable future is really the most fundamental choice any of us have in our individual lives as well as our society and, and uh, you know, from the state all the way to the, yeah. the planet. Because most people don't realize that the future is a choice. It is. And, and, and uh, in fact, who is it said? The best way to predict the future was to create. Yeah, exactly. And, and exactly. so I, I think that, the, and, and again, the, the reason we're doing California is because when we started looking at all the pieces you needed to pull this off the first time, uh -huh. the first beta site, it turned out that the best place to do it was California. The, 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 the minds, the scientific minds are there. The technological base is there. The venture capital community is there. Um, you've got a very willing legislature and now a governor who's there. In fact, I was delighted on January 5th of this year, he, he actually talked about the microgrid in his speech, in his state of the state of the state speech. So we know what to do. And, 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 and I want to come back to what you said about the corollary to the transformation movement. It's exactly what it is. It, it's about transforming people's consciousness so that they choose what they get rather than get what they didn't choose. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about what you think a community would look like if we were able to pull it off. How does not just so? How do we get the microgrid in place? Mm -hmm. But if we did have the microgrid in place, how would it look, and what difference would it make to just our daily lives? Okay, great. So, um, people underestimated what it would look like when the price of oil came down so dramatically that all of a sudden it was a dollar and a half a, gar uh, a gallon less at the pump. And we've had this reaction now amongst people, particularly the people who. Um, the 98% who isn't really wealthy. Uh, and what the reaction has been is, oh my gosh, I can save a little more, I can spend a little more. The consumer economy is taking off in this country, even though it's more abundant than the rest of the world. In fact, so much so that people who were afraid our economy would slow down because Europe has gone back in recession, uh, Japan is back in recession, England is barely climbing along, um, South America is in terrible shape, and Australia is not exporting to China anymore, so it's in trouble. And, and this world of the economic model is all slowing down. Our consumers saving money at the pump has turned the tide on basically consumer spending here in America, which is actually now becoming an engine almost as big as China. So <clears throat> we know these huge shifts can occur, and they can actually make us richer as a population, individually and collectively. What we, what we need to do is to be able to say, okay, in California, which is our, just our beta site, a place called Santa Barbara, which people think of as an affluent, above-educated community, we started a program called SB3, which stands for Santa Barbara Renewable, Reliable, Resilient, so that people could experience in their daily lives, precisely to your question, what it's like to take 100% of your energy from local renewable sources. Now, in the case of Santa Barbara, that will be primarily photovoltaic and biogas from our wastewater treatment facilities. Wow, but you know, if you think about it, in addition to the economic benefit, 
and how that would stimulate the economy. It would also, it's like any time any of us accomplish something we never thought we could accomplish, mm -hmm. it, what it translates to in terms of self-esteem, yeah. self-confidence, uh, collective pride, uh, in, in, personal in, empowerment. Self, in personal empowerment, all of that sort of comes with the accomplishment. So that the, the getting to the moon and back was an event, yeah. but the ripple effect from the moonshot, the original moonshot, was, was basically reorganized our whole society yeah. and uh, maybe was the gateway to many of the technological marvels that we're experiencing even today. Yeah, it's the birth of Silicon Valley. I mean, that's really what led to the whole explosion in microelectronics. But it also did one other thing in that, and people forget this, on the trip to the moon and back, we had to keep the astronauts alive, very important part of the mission. And what did that were fuel cells. How we did that was with fuel cells. And we, we forgot that that's the only way to store enough energy up and use it in, in non-benign in ways, because they had to live in the same capsule with fuel cell was operating, so water vapor being the only byproduct was important. So you mean fuel cells are not sort of brand new, they've no. been around for 40 years themselves. That's exactly right. As a, as a technology. Yeah, and, but they were, they were never pushed because they were such an advanced technology and no one could break into the energy world, the, the control that the energy companies, the fossil fuel companies, together with the utilities, this alliance that built up over 100 years, uh, didn't want to make any room for a competitor technology so we energy. Could, so we could have a sustainable energy economy in California using proven technology, yeah. and all the pieces are in place, and really what's missing is the leadership yeah. and the political will to make it happen. Yeah. In fact, the microgrid, is, as we like to explain it, <clears throat> we, what we've designed at the Academy, we're very proud that we... It, what we did is we combined the best minds, I call it a mosaic. We took the best minds in each of these different scientific disciplines, and like business people do, we combined them so each of them could see how together they were a picture, a mosaic. And the picture that shows up is this. It's a microelectric grid. So it's a grid that where 100% of the energy used in Santa Barbara will come from Santa Barbara. I'll come back to that in a second. No fossil fuels, no nuclear fuels, no long-distance transmission lines that people don't like. Uh, and, and, and all of the energy actually created where it's used, so distributed generation, distributed use. And all of that in a metal model that is scalable, reliable, resilient, and frankly more economic than what we have. That is both exciting and extraordinary, and yeah. I'm such an uh, excited participant, and I really appreciate being a part of it. You know, this channel is called Possible Futures, and you have just expressed and articulated one of the most uh, uh, in engaging and exciting possible futures that I've, I've ever imagined. And, and let me add one more to that, because we've got to do it in Santa Barbara first, that's where we've got the ability to do it. But this is the, the people in the villages of India will never have electricity if they have to wait for a transmission line. It's not going to happen. The people in Africa will not have electricity. One of the examples I use is when we used to believe that you had to have a copper wire to have a phone, only 23% of the population of the planet had a phone. When we said, wait a minute, do we really need to drag a copper wire down the street? No, we can go through the air. Cell phone. Oh, we went to 90%, 90%. Well, that technology of a copper wire to make a phone call started in the 1860s in New York, a 19th century technology. It took a while to get rid of it, but we overcame it. In that same decade, 1860s, is when high distance, high transmission towers for electricity came about, in also in New York. We never realized that that transition had to occur also. If you wait for the, for the wire to come down the road to get electricity, you won't have electricity. So we've been working in the academy for many years. We, we, we actually solarized a, a field hospital in Rakai, Uganda, a number of years ago, because that was the place where HIV was first discovered, and they didn't have any instruments there to detect it in the future. And the, the government of Uganda asked us, could you build a solar facility that was totally independent, has clean running water, where anybody comes out of the bush can have an operation? And we did that in Rakai, Uganda, many years ago. And and now you know why I have been so inspired by you and the World <laughs> Business Academy all these years. Those are just more and more examples of the extraordinary work you're doing. Well, thank you. And thank you, really, for the leadership that you're bringing to this work. Thanks, Tim, for having me. Thank you.